Okay, so my name is Jason Turner. Uh, I've got a few things going on. There are some of them. I've got a podcast. We're at like 215 episodes now. Rob Irving and I do this. And C++ Weekly, my YouTube channel. And MVP, Victor MVP. i sorry, I just have to keep pointing it out because that's awesome. Um, since 2015. Uh, I'm independent and available for contracting. This is kind of my sales pitch, right? But uh, this is kind of what my training looks like. This is the kind of level of interaction that I want with people. So please interrupt me and ask questions, and we'll see how this goes. Um, but I can't really ask you to move to the front. There's an empty seat right here <laughs> and one right there. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, if anyone is, who's going to CBPCon? <laughs> Okay, like two people. Uh, I'm, I'm giving a class there coming up as well on Applied Const Expert. Okay, so this talk is about code smells. Let's take a moment and talk about best practices. And if you were just here in Peter's talk a few moments ago, he mentioned the core guidelines and coding standards books. So similarly, I went and counted some of these. Uh, this is based on a, a grep of the core guidelines. And it looks like we've got about 496 of them currently. Scott Meyer's Effective Modern C++ is at 42. Uh, that doesn't count Scott's Effective C++ or More Effective C++ or Effective STL books. Uh, I've been working on my own best practices website, that's cppbestpractices.com. It's just a forkable thing on GitHub. There's about 109 things up there so far. C++ coding standards from Herb Sutter and Andre Alexandrescu, 101 best practices. And that's a fairly out-of-date book at this point, but I still like it. Uh, so I total 748 best practice items in just these, like, four short uh, things here. There's a lot of questions we have to ask. How many of them are unique? Does anyone have any idea how many of those are actually unique best practices? Now, I, just for the record, I, I don't either. I didn't count them or anything. How many of them are like important? How many of them are critical to us writing good code? How many of them are stylistic concerns? How many of them you know, really matter? How many of them can our tools tell us about? We'll discuss that more in a moment. Herbs uh, made this comment at CBPCon 2018 during his keynote. He says, we don't have to teach the things all compilers warn on. I agree with him. If we convince our programmers to use warnings. <laughs> Do you have warnings enabled in your code? Who has W all enabled and thinks that means you have all of the warnings enabled? <laughs> okay, just for the record, W all is, well, unless you're talking in Visual Studio, are you Visual Studio developers? Yeah, uh, yeah. actually, that's fun. Who all is a Visual Studio developer in the room? Okay, and Visual Studio W all does mean all of the warnings, and Clang and GCC, it's a tiny subset of the warnings, actually. Okay, so. I wanted to flip this around and see what happens if we just kind of look for code smells. Like that. Do the smells help us reduce the set of best practices to something that we can actually stop and think about instead of hundreds and hundreds of things that we're trying to keep in our mind all the time? I asked Twitter for their favorite C++ code smells, and which a lot of people think this is kind of an ironic question. How can you have a favorite smell, code smell? We don't think of code smells as good things, right? They're not strawberries and cream or something, right? Okay. So uh, Ben Dean said, construction separate from assignment. So code like this, string, and then we're assigning it the string hello world. And I don't know, because I've never given this talk before, how much I get to slow down and like actually step into what the code's doing. So we're going to see what happens. Um, I mean, I've practiced the talk, but. So this is with a very, very latest version of GCC with all optimizations enabled. This becomes a single return statement. That is actually 
really, really impressive. This did not happen before like a couple months ago, the previous version of GCC. Let's flip over to Clang. This isn't saying anything about optimizers between different compilers or anything. What we are doing here, do we want to step through every line of this? No? Okay. Uh, G, like I said, GCC did this like a month ago, right? Like it's, it's an arms race in our compiler optimizers these days. So uh, we are default constructing a string on line five, and then we are assigning it a value on line seven. Generally speaking, the compiler, I'm, I'm actually very surprised that GCC is optimizing this. It is two separate operations. We have asked it to default con construct something, then we have asked it to call the assignment operator on it. So this is one of the things that Ben uh, complained about here, construction versus assignment. So better is this, construction and assignment, if you will, uh, in the same operation. And now GCC or Clang, um, it shouldn't matter. This particular build of Clang that I have installed at the moment has, um, actually, I'm going to do it this way. This bit is uh, it's a little bit of a regression in the com compiler currently. It's just not optimizing out a couple of stack operations. Don't worry about that a whole lot, but it's basically a no-op. It's one reason I have GCC as my default compiler at the moment for today. All right, any comments on this? It's really simple, straightforward stuff at the start here. Uh, Oliver. Um, he is our uh, 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 very active on Twitter. Said out parameters. This is a typical out parameter. We are defining the value and then we are assigning the value using a get value function. You write code like this? Used to. Used to? Okay. So, same kind of deal. We have to default construct the value. And then we have to pass it into this function to uh, fill in its value. This GCC, we're setting up the string, we're default constructing it, we're passing it by reference to the function. The, the disassembly on line 10 is where we're actually calling the function. And then after that, stack cleanup and the possibility of dealing with memory that had to be destroyed or whatever, we see two different deletes in here. The plan is not to step through every line of assembly, right? But we can. Oops. Ah. I fast forwarded. Compared to this version, right here. So again, we are getting the return value, we're assigning it, we're doing this in one operation. Anyone can tell me what this code actually has to do here? Do we have any copying of data happening? No? Do we have an assignment operation happening? No? If I were to remove that const auto value equals, would it change the nature of this code at all? I'm waiting for the person who answered the last two. Would it? I don't think it would. Because either way, it's going to have to deal with the return value from this function. So if I return that, yeah, code, the optimized code stayed exactly the same. All right, so I'm going to give you a little piece of swag. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, how many parameters does this function take? One? What, what is the one? The address of the return value. Who said it depends? So it depends whether you can optimize the return value. 
Yeah, it, so it basically has to, uh, because a string, well, it's a little bit complicated, but because a string is not like trivially copyable in the size of a register and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it basically is one. We're going to have to push the return value of this uh, function, the, the, the return memory location, that is, into this function. This is a function that takes one parameter. Looks like a function that takes zero. It's a function that takes one. So this comes up, uh, Sean Parents uh, wrote an article on this, stop using out arguments, construction versus assignment kind of article that Sean wrote a little while ago. If you don't know who Sean Parent is, you should watch his videos, read his articles, good stuff. Sean is also a fan of saying there should be no raw loops in our code. He did not respond on Twitter, unfortunately, though. I like to pace when I'm speaking. The camera at this point is not pointing at me at all. That's OK. Um, raw loops don't express intent. What does this code do? I'm even using a ranged for loop. I could have made this harder to read if I'd wanted to. Sex if, if all the values are within the range of 5 to 100, right? Exclusive 5 to 100, I guess, right? And if it is, then we do some further processing on the data. Let's flip this around and not use a ranged for loop. Let's use an algorithm. The more I look at code like this, the more I like it. Line 12. I can read this like a sentence. If all of the values from the beginning to the end are in range, then process more. I don't even need, actually, the all in range value at all if I don't want it at this point. Do you prefer this version or this version? Who prefers option A? Who prefers option B? OK, it's interesting. I still usually have a few holdouts from people that are like, no, I don't like functional algorithm things. OK. Um, anyone have any questions or any problem with the lambda that I defined on line 7? It's a lambda function. I'm saying this is an operation in range. You could, I could have made it a free function. It doesn't really matter for this case. Questions? All right. Bjorn Fallers, Bjorn in the room? Bjorn's not in the room. OK. Tony Van Eerd, Peter, Peter also left the room. Um, they all said things like multi step functions. I'm going to leave this one up for a moment for you to ponder this code. I'll get a drink of water, and you tell me some things that you don't like about it. This is actually derived from some physics code that I was looking at recently. There's at least two bugs that you should see, and it probably compiles without warning. Yeah, so on step two, you're saying, I should have used toes here, and I'm comparing with pipes. Yeah. Yes, or I'm, I'm, I'm multiplying by pipes. All right, what else? Very similar code. Very similar code. We don't like that. We're using ints, yes, which is doing what probably in my code? Which, which ints are you referring to? Control variables. The control variables. So these ints are limited to 2 billion hoses and pipes each, um, approximately, because on every modern platform, an int is a signed 32-bit integer. Um, does anyone work with data sets that are more than 2 billion items at once? No one? Oh, Hannah does. I didn't see your hand back there. What kind of data set sizes do you work with? Are you allowed to say? 
You cannot say, okay. Uh, sometimes I do training at companies that do things like database development. This comes up, right? You're like two billion items in a data, Pff, that's nothing, right? And then half of you are like, I do embedded programming five elements is a lot, right? <laughs> that's the power of C++, right? It's everywhere. Okay. Which one? The value is an int. Yeah, okay, so I've got value as an int and I'm returning a double, which makes us question the nature of this code altogether, right? Okay. Lots of things to think about and reason about. Now, Tony and uh, Bjorn and Peter all said things like, if they're reading a function and they see the words step one, step two, then it makes them want to cry, basically. So they all went through and grepped all of their code bases and it caused a little short thing in this Twitter thread. Everyone's like, oh, I'm so glad I didn't find step anywhere in my code base. <sighs> yeah, that's the bug there. So we can flip this around. I don't care if you want to make this functions or lambdas or whatever, but now I can read this code again as return the total area of the pipes with the total area of the hoses plus whatever else thing needs to happen in here. This doesn't have to have multiple steps in it. One operation each. Comment? Uh, it's still two steps. You're saying here and here? Yes. I don't technically disagree with you, but how would we flip it around to like, like can we literally make this less than? What's that? Like a map or a file. Yeah, do if you did like a map or like. It might be less readable. Right. Okay. This, well, you know what? Now you're making me seriously question the nature of this example because you pointed that out. <laughs> Are we better off here than we were here? It is kind of still two steps, yeah. This is part, yeah, it's part of the problem of trying to get it all to fit on one slide, too. Like, I even struggled with, okay, how big do I make each of these loops so that it fits on a slide, but I still have a multi-step function so that we can argue about it. All right. Well, we'll leave it how it is because, well, I'm not going to live edit the slide at the moment. Um, I ask, though, at this point, are comments necessary in this code? You're free to say yes, just for the record. Yeah? The very first line uh, is for a specific area implementation. It is a specific area implementation. That is true. Yeah, and this accumulate area, by the way, is looking for is something that would be appropriate for passing the, to the accumulate algorithm because it needs to take the current area to this point and then calculate the area of the next thing in the operation. So it might want to comment that something like calculating the area of a, of a radius or something like that. Okay. Uh, this is something I ran into. This isn't from my, my Twitters. Non-canonical canonical operators. This is an operator overload for the comparison operator. Of course, for anyone who wants to point this out in C++20, we will actually get um, uh, the, the spaceship operator things that can do these for us. But I, I saw code that looked just like this, which is why it ended up on a slide, like literally just like this a couple months ago in real life code. So what are the problems with it? Data should be const and? And the operator itself should be const, yes. At least two consts missing. Well, exactly two consts missing. 
Code with conversions, implicit, explicit cast, like many, many people commented on this. Implicit conversions really get on my nerves. Um, with this one, which int is which? Say so comment from Arna Mertz uh, and a uh, follow-up from Matt. He says this is also known as the which int is which interface with a credit to Edwin Brady, who I don't know. You're familiar with interfaces like this? How often do you get the parameter order incorrect? <laughs> do you have any way of checking to see if the parameter order is correct except for tests? So this was already pointed out that we were doing implicit conversion here, although I must say, I had this slide up for a while before any of you said, hey, wait a minute, the value is an int. Depending on your compiler settings, you may not get a warning from this. You probably will get a loss of precision warning, but we don't know, actually, if the... Uh, we, we, we presume, probably, that the hose and pipe radii are floating point values, not integral values, because otherwise multiplying by pi would be kind of a waste. Anything? Questions? All right. So we had conversions in at least one place, probably three loss of data in that code. This is one of my favorite examples. I, uh, I have written this code, I have seen this code. Have you written this code? What are we doing when we step through it here? We're getting a string on line nine, and then we're getting the C string of that string on line 10 and then passing that to a function expecting a string. How many strings did I just make? This is easy to do. It's easy to get wrong. It's easy to the point that there's actually a special check and clang tidy just for this specific mistake in your code, which Victor is well familiar with. <laughs> you, you fixed a bunch of them, yes. What happened, by the way, uh, is you, you have this use string function that expects a const character pointer. And then at some point, you know, because you wrote the code in like 2005, you go through and you're like, well, you know what, this should actually take like a string because this is pre C17. And then this line of code never got refactored. That's what happens. But this implicit conversion from a const character pointer to a string, it all con continues to compile silently with no, no problem. I am willing to bet that this always exists in code that has been around for a long time. It is somewhere in your code base. All right, what is move? At least one of my students is in this class. Yeah, what is move? It's a cast. Here, take one of these. Pass that back. I could have thrown it at you, but I'm afraid I would have actually hit someone in the eye and that would have been really bad. Move is a cast. That is all that it is. It is an unconditional cast to an R value reference of the given type. So this is an unconditional cast to an R value reference of a string. Thoughts? Yeah, go for it, Victor. It's a pessimization. It inhibits uh, RVO. Uh, it re inhibits RVO. This b forces a move instead of allowing the compiler to optimize it. Uh, this is the pessimizing return by move. Prevents move elision. This is a type of conversion that is a code smell in our code. Standard move itself is a code smell. All right. What is returned from main? <laughs> What's that? Whatever. Whatever. <clears throat> this, is, this is undefined behavior. You're not allowed to modify an object that's been const, uh, defined const during its lifetime. It's always a fun one to actually step into because every compiler does the exact same thing. 
and an optimized build completely ignores the const cast. And an unoptimized build, and this is what makes it really fun if you've never actually looked at this, is it sets up the object on the stack, it assigns the value four on line four, and then two lines later, let's see, on line six, it assigns the value 13. It has dutifully done exactly what we asked it to do. Then on line seven, it returns four from main. It still completely ignores us. Modifying const object during its lifetime is undefined behavior. Const cast is definitely a code smell. Uh, yes. Does anyone have const cast in their code today? You have like your hand up for everything. Is there anyone over here? Who's using con const cast? No one? You are? Correctly? Probably not. <laughs> I've, uh, I've, I've only seen like two correct uses of it. Are you using it to talk to an old C API? Yeah, then you're hopefully doing it correctly, although I'm still leaning towards just not making the object const at all when passing it to a C API, so there's no question, because we have no way of guaranteeing that that thing isn't trying to mutate the data somewhere in whatever library that you got from whomever. That's my, my conclusion at this point. All right, uh, Bjorn said, and uh, Dimitar Mirchev, Dimitar Mirchev, is that close? Does anyone know? Okay. Uh, he says, uh, they say, code with warnings. I'm pulling this one back up again. Can our compilers warn on this? Yes, they can. We can turn on um, our floating point conversions, our loss of uh, precision warnings, we can get warnings on this, so yay, that's good. Can our compilers warn on this? Yes, they can now. We have a pessimizing uh, move and clang. Pessimizing move, finally, from our compiler. That's good. This one is one that I ran into several times recently, and I just want to... There was some question about const global data in the last session. Um, what are the implications of using the static variable? Does anyone know? Internal linkage. Internal linkage, yeah, that's not what I'm going for. What happens when line eight of this function is executed? Right here. String is constructed the first time. What happens the second time? It skips? How does it skip it? It has a hidden Boolean variable. We love being able to click on examples and read what they're doing. Let's just do this. If you're not familiar with Compiler Explorer, by the way, we can do this right click and choose Reveal Linked Code, if we're so inclined. Every single time this function is entered, it has to check a guard variable to see if the string has been initialized yet. If it hasn't been initialized, it has to acquire a lock guard. It then has to initialize the variable and free the lock. It has to do that check every single time we call this function. It's not an insignificant amount of code that it has to generate. All compilers do this. They're required to do this. This is thread-safe initialization of statics. It is a requirement of C++11. It's been implemented in GCC and Clang since forever and Visual Studio in 2015. Not free. Um, compared to this, now I've cheated a little bit because I also made these string views, but that's because I can. Because you know what? The name of this function, do things, this is not changing at runtime. If it is, you have other problems in your code, right? So I made this a string view, and the advantage, one advantage of making a string view is I can make a const expert. Now, in C++ 20, I could have made the string const expert. Who gets to program in C++ 20 today? Yeah. Okay, who gets to program in C17 today? Yeah, string view, you have string view, you have const expert support here. What does this code look like? 
Do I, do I now have to do a, uh, a mutex check, an atomic check, to see if this variable's been initialized? Nope. That's all gone. I get to, at compile time, initialize this string view object and pass it around. So, static const is a code smell that should probably be const expr. And I say that strongly, actually. I say probably, I should perhaps say likely. Uh, it, is, it is the only times that we have static const that we can't make const expr is things that we're doing dynamic allocations on, which at the moment we can't do const expr. And maybe we don't need those dynamic allocations in the first place because it's probably something that we know at compile time. And what? Yes, in 20. But, oh, you thought you, oh, oh, it's not allowed to leave the const expert context. You're only allowed to use it in a const expert function at compile time. Right. Yes, so use string view. This is the right answer even in C20. Thank you, Hannah. Okay. Yes, I do need to have it. Kind of, in this case. Um, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's, let's do this, actually. Uh, let's see what we have, because at the moment, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I'll, well, I'll tell you what I'm not sure about in a moment, but let's just leave this code, and then I'm just going to remove static and see if it changes the generated code at all. It, it did by one instruction. That's not helpful. Okay. Context for static logically is correct, right? We're saying do this at compile time, and it's a global value from all the functions, or all the uh, instances of the, or whatever, all the calls to this function. Older versions of GCC had a regression where if I did not put context for static, it may actually generate this object each time at runtime, even though it was context for. It was allowed to do that, actually, because the rest of this function isn't a context for function. None of this is being required to be done at compile time, so it was allowed to. Context for static works well. It is definitely going to do it at compile time on all, well, Definitely going to do it at compile time in all compilers, okay. Um, that's, sorry for the air quotes. Ooh, and I was over here, so I don't know if the camera got them. Just do my calisthenics, okay. But I think it's also logically the right thing. Who asked that question? Okay. I think it's, it's, it's logically the correct thing anyhow, right? Because we say this is a global thing, right? It's, it's static for the lifetime of the program. We want it done at compile time. Static const is a code smell. Should be const expr. Extern const. I saw this for the first time ever just a few weeks ago when I was preparing for this. Code that looked like this. Extern int const and then in a CVP file, int const value equals five, and then somewhere else actually using this extern int const. What is this doing? I'm gonna simplify it. It's approximately like this by the time we've done the includes. What does this get value have to do? Does anyone know? It's kind of like, we're telling the compiler, I have some really important information to, for you that's known at compile time, but I'm not gonna tell you. It's really what it is. If I do this, every single time this function's executed, it has to go somewhere to some memory location and say, what's the value of that constant data that you should already know? As just out of curiosity, raise your hand if you have seen or written extern const. What is the logical reason for it? How did it end up in your code? Your hand is the highest. Oh, it was there. Okay, so you, you're, you know you're claiming no responsibility for it. Yes. Uh, 
Mizra or something? No. Yeah, yeah, really? Not exactly that, but yeah. Okay. Okay. So for the sake of the rest of you all, uh, he said it was already in the code when he got there, and then he needed to add his own constants, and he didn't want to break the existing style, so he maintained the existing style of adding more extern consts. Is that fair? And the code is under restrictions; could not be modified too much. Can anyone tell me like a good reason to do this? Because I honestly, truly don't know of one, and I just want to know if I'm missing something. Okay. Uh, ooh, you have a good reason. So a good reason could be a mistake reading from initialization of static member data from a class that you copied a pattern of not being allowed to initialize static member data. Ah. Uh. Okay, so you're saying you're, th you know, perhaps someone like it was. This was originally wrapped in a class or something, and they couldn't initialize it in place, and they, or they're they're used to that line of thinking, which fortunately we can do in C++ 17 inline initialization of static const data and in, uh, and can make inline variables. Yes. Maybe using the linker to get different applications. Using the linker to get different applications. <sighs> Is that a good application? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not, okay. All right, so what's our alternative, though? I mean, besides just initializing it in place, right? Constexper. This is C++ 11, right? This is what we want to do for the most part. We want to say constexper int, this is the value. This is, or put it in an enumeration, perhaps, depending on the application. Raw, new, and delete. Uh, right, that's bad, right? You almost all raised your hand saying C++ 17 or better, or whatever. So make unique. This is, of course, wasteful, and the heap should be avoided if possible. This is just an example. We don't want to use raw pointers if we can. All right, so the code smells that we have covered so far are construction separate from assignment, output variables, raw loops, multi-step functions, non-canonical operators, code with conversions, casting away const, code with warnings, static const, extern const, and raw new and delete. Have I done anything yet to reduce the set of things that we're looking for in our code? Because I've really just kind of touched on a bunch of stuff. Are we better off yet? I don't think so. Those are the, sm yeah, there's like lots of pictures taking, it'll get better. Just so you know. All right, this comes from, is Seth in the room? No, okay. This comes from a magazine that I bought when I was at C++ on C. And it has been a magazine that has met me with very many uh, opportunities for code examples. It's a magazine on learning how to program in C++. This is one of the examples. It makes me so happy. Okay. All right, let's do it. What, now, Let's say for the sake of this example, we do want to keep three separate variables here because this is a teaching example about like concatenating strings and stuff. Go ahead, talk to me. What should I change first? Line two. Line two. All right, you want to get rid of using namespace. That's fine. All right, let me uh, get it compiling first. Okay, now what? Oh wait, someone said line one, what? what? Line one, I don't even need line one. I'm not printing this thing out. Okay, what was the next one? Integer length. Integer length as opposed to, what do you want me to do with it? Size T. You want me to do size T, okay. I'll start with that. All right, now what? Move okay, move the declaration down here. Uh, yay, live programming. Oh, you want an auto now, okay. All right, oh, st we, st we have a problem still, right? The code's not compiling. Hold on. All right, what's that? Const. Oh, which one do you want const? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll worry about that in a minute. Okay, fine. 
One more. One more on length. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Now, what else? Anything else we'd like to change? Yeah, well, I'm not actually doing anything. Although, technically, C++ doesn't require a return statement for main. It's default zero. This is not undefined behavior for main because it's special, but we may as well do something with the value that we calculated. I am honestly super impressed with the latest set of optimizations that GCC has managed to do around string objects. That's crazy good. That's crazy good. We defined two strings, we concatenated them, and calculated the value, and it threw it all away. If you're not impressed, you really should be. That's, I think, new in GCC 9 that, that's doing these things. All right, would you change anything else? I mean, assuming, I, I don't know if you, I think you walked in a second too late, Peter. I was saying this is a teaching example. We're leaving the fact that we've got three strings on here for the sake of a teaching example. Well, I would change one more thing just because I would do that. Um, because I don't really care what the result type of this thing is. Okay, look good? Uh, if I did the, the, the S at the end, then I have to do using namespace, literals, whatever. I just, oh, I find it so tiring. I just prefer writing string most of the time, honestly. Uh, but yes, we could rearrange it so that we're using the string literals uh, suffix. Okay. I am now officially moving slower than I meant to be, so we will go faster. All right, that was fun. Uh, we ended up with mm, ish, maybe something like that. I didn't get rid of the using namespace std up there. This one, um, factorial. Instead of live editing this, maybe take a few uh, looks at this and tell me, like, this reads input from the user and then calculates the factorial. Just yell out a couple things. I used, uh, should be down, uh, and should be initialized. I should be down, and should be initialized. Factorial arguably should be down to. Uh, there's an end line at the end of line 14, which I just personally despise, but you know, it's a different topic entirely. OK, so rearranging these values so that we can initialize them. What's our ultimate way that we could actually initialize all these variables uh, and not have to define something, then assign a value to it? No, I'm talking about like, uh, well, OK. How about if we create functions? That's what I'm going for. So this is a complete compilable version of this. I've got my read input function. It's a template, whatever, because I'm just reading something from CN. But then I get down here to main, and I can say, read the input, calculate the factorial of it, and print the values. And, and by the way, in this case, I am returning exit success from main to keep things nice and kosher here, too. All right. The conclusions that I ran into working on this is that one thing kept coming up over and over again that had not explicitly been mentioned. Did anyone catch what it was? I mean, it came up in the code reviews, it came up in the examples repeatedly. Whoever gets the answer gets a card. Anyone? Anyone? Here, we'll run through it. Um, construction separate from assignment. What do we see? Const. Output variables. What do we see? Const. Raw loops. What do we see? Const. I'm, getting, I'm trying to get everyone talking together. Const. OK. What kept coming up? Const kept coming up. Um, it's not like this is the first time const has ever been mentioned at a conference, just for the record. I'm not going to claim any like 
Well, I claim some responsibility for this. Okay. I'm gonna, this is Kate Gregory. Marking everything const that you possibly can. Not like, oh, I have to, and then getting away with whatever you don't have to, but turning it around and saying, mark it const unless I absolutely can't. Because then, remember, the compiler is your friend. And so anywhere that you have any kind of errors of thought, they'll be caught for you. No, this is me. Does anyone have any ideas for how we might be able to get this to use less overhead? Did, did I hear const expert? I'm going to pause right there. Just for the record, const expert is a little bit of a joke at this point in 2016. Today, I'm like, const expert, all the things. Can anyone think of of a simpler way to get this to have less overhead. What's that? Pre-computed table. Uh, yeah, that could work, but const expert would kind of get us there, I think, anyhow. So, is there some best practice about using const anywhere possible? Has anyone ever heard that? So what happens if we make our static ar array here of color data Const. <laughs> okay, so what actually happened there, by the way? Like, I mean, I, I have like three years to reflect on this. We made this const, the compiler moved it into the read-only section of the binary, Therefore, the compiler saw more optimization opportunities and it ran all of our standard algorithms and everything at compile time simply because it could. I didn't even have to use const expert yet at this point. Uh, yeah, so const. We want to use const everywhere that we can. Any lack of const is a code smell. Const forces us into more organized code, prevents common errors, and encourages the use of more algorithms. Now we have a bunch of questions. Do we const value parameters? Should I have const count in this code? This came, who came to the meetup on Tuesday night? Yeah, this came up a lot, right? Do I const this count? Yes. yes. Why? Because I have a bug in my code. Yes, thank you, Peter. It does change this code. Oh, sorry, because it doesn't change, but it does change the code. Did you see the bug? because I don't want it to change. Just for the record, I actually wrote this code and then realized, oh, wait a minute, if const had been on there, it would have prevented this bug, all right? So I'm incrementing count instead of incrementing my uh, index or whatever you want to call it, my counter. All right, real error I've actually made. This now fails to compile. It's intentional. Do you const temporary values? What, is, what are we doing here on line eight? We already just covered this. What is move? It's a cast to an R value reference. Can I move a const object? No, this is a copy. Oops. Um, I made it not const. Oh no, now it's not const. Sad face. How do I resolve this problem? What's that? Don't have a temporary. No reason to have that value. Void the temporary altogether. Uh, or write a function. Functions are amazing. They've been around since when? Who knows when functions were invented? Peter, you, I mean, you were just kind of talking about some of this. I don't even know what. 1940s. 1940s or something? Yeah. Fun aside, our hardware is designed to make function calls fast. Like, since the 70s, uh, or a late 70s, early 80s, Intel, when they were working on the AD86, said we want to make, um, make Algol-like languages fast on our CPU. Languages with function calls, okay? Is this okay? I see one head waving no, why not? as a const object and we're trying to return it. So we don't want to do the standard move thing here, right? Because we already know that that's going to revert to a, to a move when it could be RVO'd. I will say this actually is okay. 
This does work with return value optimization. You always have this. It is the nature of calling a function in C++. I, you, you will not be able to show me a compiler at any optimization level that does not use return value optimization here, going back to 1997 at least. Uh, because it's the nature of how we call it. Remember in the, in the version when I said how many parameters does git string take, and we agreed one, it's because it's the location where that value needs to live. What about this though? Am I, am, I, am I getting return value optimization? Am I getting a copy or am I getting a move here? You say I'm getting a copy. It, it is a copy, yes, and since we're running out of time, I'll move a little bit faster. Return value optimization is not going to apply here. Worst case, though, is we actually have to initialize value and value two and then decide which one of them. Technically, we want to move out. As of C++11, it's equivalent to doing this, but we can't move a const object. They become copies. This, however, does fall back into the case of return value optimization interestingly, because the scope is limited to the return statement. I don't know if I can promise you that it will on all platforms in this example, but I think it will. Of course, we can avoid this question altogether by avoiding the temporary. Um, I saw this code over and over and over again in LLVM. I started to compile a recent version of Clang just for this talk, and I saw all these warnings pop past. So I saw this. What is the warning that I am getting from, LL, uh, from Clang while compiling Clang on this line of code on line five? Does anyone know? Returning from void function. Oh. <laughs> okay. What is the value that I'd be getting from Clang here? It is redundant move because this is implicitly a move here um, on line five, as of C++11. Does generate a warning, Redun redundant move and return statement. Do we const return value types? Do I const the string? No, why? What's that? It's evil. It breaks move semantics, uh, yes. It, it, apparently it used to be a thing to do because this would fail to compile if that were const. I never saw anyone const return values before, so I was actually surprised to learn in like 2015 that this used to be a thing when I started programming in 20, 2002 or so professionally. Uh, it's an interesting side effect of trying to make it behave more like built-in types. This is, not, this is not compilable. We can't do this in C++. So if we do this, we get move assignment on line 10. Now, of course, how do we avoid this question altogether? Initialize it all in the same line, like this. So we don't want to const value return types breaks move operations. So my conclusion ultimately is I found three smells. Just for the record, I really, really wanted it to be only one smell, but I had to end up with three. Uh, missing and ignored compiler warnings. Special checks for many of these things. CVP check helps us reduce variable scope. Um, variable can be const. Various tools can tell us this. The core guidelines checkers help us reduce raw pointers and memory usage. Pessimizing move, warnings, const return values, and clang tidy. So that's smell one. Missing and ignored compiler warnings. Number two. Missing const, const expr, misplaced const. Why isn't that value const or, or member function const? If it's known at compile time, it should be const expr or an enum. This forces us into more efficient, more organized code where we utilize array, algorithms, and numerics. This is my quote. I am quoting myself here. I don't care if you use east const or west const. Just const your variables. And uh, I'm not a AAA, that's the almost always auto. I'm not a AAA fan, but it does push us in the same direction as const. So if we are using auto, then we have to initialize these values. 
Weak types and casting. Um, this is unfortunate because string, file system, path, const character pointers, string views, optional, variant, shared pointer, these all have these implicit casts that exist in them. Unique pointer does as well. And this uh, contributes to many of these issues for us, unfortunately. But uh, we can try to use stronger typing where we can. We can use uh, options, uh, numbers one and two here to try to catch the rest of these issues. Generally speaking, we just have to read our code, try to use auto, because auto doesn't coerce types, so that will prevent implicit conversions. You use correct types to avoid casting and avoid naming temporaries when we can so that we avoid the standard move smell. Uh, and I am out of time to hit this bit. Well, I have like one minute left. Um, but just for the record, we can apply const in all the standard algorithms. Well, this doesn't have const. We apply a standard algorithm, we get const, and we make our own new algorithm. So that's where I leave off. But with like two minutes left, are there any questions or anything you'd like me to go back to? All right, cool. Thanks, everyone.